we present Rachel Gurney and Richard Herndl in A Day by the Sea by N.C. Hunter, adapted for broadcasting by Molly Greenhouse. A Day by the Sea. Lily? I can't find Hush. her. Shh! Not so much noise, Toby. Your Uncle David's asleep. Asleep? He's only just got up. Never mind. When you're over 80, you'll want to sleep too. Now, run away now and take Lily up to the field and fly your kite. Here's your mother and Mrs. Anson and they'll be wanting to talk. All right. Lily! Lily! And not so much noise, I said. But why, Francis? Why? Oh, good morning, Mattie. Uh, good morning, Mrs. Anson. Oh, Mattie, don't let me forget to go through the children's school list with you before you pack, will you? Very good, Mrs. Farrer. Really, Francis, if you hadn't come this time, I should have despaired of ever seeing you again. I should really have been offended. I felt so ashamed, I only wanted to hide. Do you know, when I got out of the train last night, I imagined people were staring at me and saying, Look, there she is. Oh, my dear girl, I don't suppose anyone gave it a thought. You're not the first woman to be divorced. No, but the circumstances, Laura, you must admit, were... And then to come back here, where the village people knew me as a child. Yes, but do remember, that's nearly 20 years ago. Why did you never come back, dear? We were all so fond of you, and you left us married and simply disappeared into thin air. Why? A <laughs> mysterious creature. It's so difficult to explain. You must have thought me dreadfully ungrateful, but it wasn't that. Really, I began to wonder whether you'd been unhappy here. Unhappy? Oh, this is the only house that's ever meant home to me. <laughs> I dare say it looks much the same. I'm too old to make any changes, and of course Julian never suggests anything. By the way, how do you think he's looking? Not very well, rather thin and harassed. Oh, well, of course, he works far too hard. Simply ridiculous. He's ruining his health, and for what? He could hardly take life more seriously if he were the foreign secretary. And the fact is, he hasn't been particularly successful. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, he doesn't talk about it much, but I know he's disappointed. If only he wouldn't worry so. If only he'd be a little more tolerant and easygoing. He was never that. Really, the way he talks sometimes, you'd think the fate of Europe depended on him. <laughs> However, when he's at home, I take good care to bring him down to earth. After all, although I run it, this place is actually his. Ian made it over to him years before he died. So I insist that he takes an interest in it and goes through the accounts with old Gregson. You remember Willie Gregson, mm -hmm. Ian's solicitor? Julian can't bear him, poor Julian. I'm afraid he wasn't very pleased to see me. Oh, really, I felt extremely angry with him last night. When one remembers that you and he were brought up here together like brother and sister. He disapproves of me. Oh, how can he be so stupid? Oh, I don't blame him. Well, of course, he's, he's absurdly single-minded. Julian! Oh, if only I could have persuaded him to, to marry. Just think of the difference it would have made to him. Julian, dear! Yes! I'm here. No, not you, David, dear. Oh. Go to sleep again. Uh, what about my medicine? He's getting very forgetful. A doctor? He worries about his medicine, and it's probably only peppermint. <laughs> I keep hearing children. Whose are they? I've told him half a dozen times. They're Francis's children, David. You remember Frances, the Ledward's little girl who came to live with us after her parents died? You remember, surely? Yes, of course I do. Uh, you've been away some time. I have indeed, Mr. Anson. <laughs> some time. Uh, what's funny about that? Nothing, dear. Uh, uh, here's the doctor with your medicine. Uh, here I come with my elixir. There you are. I'll swallow it up. Uh, filthy stuff. Still, I don't suppose it does me much harm. Much harm? It's making a new man of you. Oh, really funny. Now for your little walk, dear. I don't want a little walk. Just to the pond and back. Up you get. Uh, you always feel better after some exercise, don't uh, you? Uh, then this afternoon you shall sleep. We shall all be out and no one will disturb you. Where are you going? Just to the beach for a picnic. 
It's the children's last day. Can't I come? You wouldn't like it, dear. Yes, I should. I'm sick of the garden. But there's no shade. You'll get hot and uncomfortable. Hot? My dear girl, I've been in places where a day like this would be considered bitterly cold. One year old, of course, no one knows what the devil to do with you. Well, come on, Doctor. Oh. Come to the pond. And this afternoon, to the picnic. Oh, Eighteen years he's been here. When he first came, he was wonderfully active. But now, of course... Julian, do come out. I promised Ian that David should live here, but you've no idea how difficult it was to find someone suitable to look after him. It had to be a man of a certain education, and if you want that, then you've got to pay. In this case, the price is gin. Gin? Rows of bottles we found behind his dressing table this morning. Ju Julian, dear, didn't you hear me calling? I'd forgotten we had all those azaleas. When was I last here in May? Oh, you may well ask. He's never at home now. Never. He's always organising Europe. Oh, do for goodness sake, relax, Julian. Sit in the sun and put your feet up. You look as if you lived underground for the past six months. Francis thinks so, too. I'm perfectly well, as it happens, and sitting in the sun doesn't agree with me. After ten minutes, I'm simply exhausted. Oh, nonsense, dear. And this afternoon, we're going for a picnic on the beach. A picnic? That's a good idea. I'm only sorry I shan't be able to come. There. You see, Francis? He instantly dissociates himself from our childish amusements. Why can't you come? I told you surely last night, Humphrey Caldwell is coming over to see me. Well, then he shall come to the picnic too. Why not? I gathered he particularly wants to talk business. He isn't motoring 30 miles to eat jam sandwiches on the shore. Well, if you must talk business, nobody's going to stop you. You can go off together and whisper your secrets behind a rock. We shall be very disappointed indeed if you don't come, won't we, Francis? Yes, very. Uh, Mother, dear, how can we possibly well, discuss business? Of course business? you can, dear. Now, come and help me with the flowers, Francis. Yes, of course. Now, just forget the troubles of Europe for half an hour anyway. Oh, now, Willie, what do you want? Oh, just a few matters. Oh, do stop chasing them about with bills and accounts. Sit down, both of you, and enjoy God's sunlight for once. <laughs> A great character, your mother, Julie. Yes, yes. I sometimes think she believes I selected my profession solely with the idea of annoying her. Every time I come home, it's the same story. For about ten minutes, she seems pleased to see me. And after that, she never stops making derogatory remarks about my work and interests. You and your ridiculous foreign politics, and so on. Oh, I see. And her ignorance of everything that goes on outside this house and garden is simply astonishing. Mention Europe or America... And she instantly looks bored and changes the subject. <laughs> Ask her the simplest question about world affairs and she couldn't answer it. Yesterday, for instance, she said to me, let me see, who is the foreign secretary nowadays? Well, well, well. To my mother, no doubt. This tiny world of hers seems very peaceful, very secure. No doubt it's pleasanter to saunter in a rose garden than to face the facts of our situation. That's why she derives such pleasure from obliging me to do rather trivial things with the excuse that it's teaching me about human nature. <laughs> now she insists on inviting you here every time I come home in order that I may be shown the accounts. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, well, please don't think I'm not delighted to see you here at any time. Oh, thank you. But I to mean... be perfectly frank with you, Gregson, I'm just not interested in playing the part of a country squire. The business of running an estate seems to me an irrelevant, an anachronism. I can assure you that sometimes, after a day's work, I have the feeling that I, that all of us, are like a lot of children, absorbed in a game of marbles at the foot of a mountain, while overhead a great avalanche is beginning to rumble and slide. Matty! Matty! <coughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did you want something? No, thank you. Uh, it was just to tell Matty we found the spotted flycatcher's nest. I see. I dare say she's in the house. It doesn't matter. Thank you. How long have these children been here? Oh, about uh, ten days, I believe. Seems rather curious. Well, I think your mother likes having them. I remember their mother when she first came here from India. A little orphan girl of ten or twelve. Very pale, nothing to look at. Well, you'll remember, of course. Yes. She's certainly grown into a fine-looking woman. But what misfortunes. 
her first husband killed in the war, and then this other unhappy affair. Oh, it's bad luck. Bad luck? That's certainly a charitable way of describing it. However, it's no business of mine. Well, we uh, may as well finish these accounts and have done with them. Uh, <coughs> there are just uh, two matters. Mm. Uh, firstly, your mother promised Adams to rebuild their pigsty. The drainage is the trouble. With pigs, it's essential to have a good runaway, as you can imagine. And the ground necessitates... Uh, oh, but uh, <coughs> let me uh, show you the plans. Oh, never mind about the plans. If it's necessary, do it. I agree. Uh, what's the other matter? Now, this, I fear, is rather unpleasant. I can't read it. it looks like gin. It is gin. Now, I can hardly believe that your mother and the old gentleman consume that quantity of spirits. Of course not. The doctor drinks it. Surely you know that. I've suspected it for months. Oh, really? This has been a most unsatisfactory appointment. I do think the time has come when we should consider getting someone more suitable. A doctor who drinks in a house with a lady and an elderly uh, gentleman. Uh, <coughs> a big one? The governess was listening. Oh. We've discussed all this before. The difficulty, as you know, is to find anyone else. Besides, Uncle David likes him. Then what's to be done? Are we to continue to tolerate his behaviour? We must keep a sense of proportion. He drinks, certainly, but it's not the end of the world. He only talks too much and gets boring. When one remembers that your uncle only asked him for the weekend, and now he's been here seven years. A long weekend, certainly. Oh, really? I must say I consider this a very serious situation. Oh, my dear fellow, don't let's use such enormous words to describe a trivial annoyance. I mean, look what's happening to Europe. What's a drunken doctor, more or less, in such a world? Well, yes, by comparison, no doubt. Before he came, my mother was run off her feet looking after the old man. Peace isn't too expensive at 30 bob a bottle. <laughs> yes, I dare say, but am I to pay this, then, without a word? You're not disputing the fact that the gin has been consumed? No, but yeah, I... have heard, of course. I'll speak to my mother about the doctor. It'll be absolutely useless. I hope I'm not disturbing any serious business. Not at all. I was just saying, I remember when you first came here from India. A little girl with a pigtail. Don't say how long ago. <laughs> you were shy at first and rather serious and thin. But how you used to run and climb trees, perfectly astounding. <laughs> do you remember, Julian? <laughs> yes, I do. And swim. I remember Mrs. Anson standing at the sea's edge shouting for you. And there you both would be. A hundred yards out, splashing away as happily as anything. <laughs> oh, that takes us back some time. <coughs> yes, well, uh, I'm here to work. I shall have a few papers ready for your signature later, if I may trouble you. Certainly. Then, uh, if you'll excuse me, I expect you have a good deal to talk about. Your mother put me back in the room I always used to have. When I woke this morning, it felt as if I'd never left here at all. It's a curious sensation to come back to a house after 20 years and see one's children playing where one once played oneself. Rather eerie, as though one were watching one's own ghost. What do you think of my children? They seem very nice. Their father was a very nice man. I never met him. No, no, you did. I was forgetting. Of course, he hardly knew his children. They were so young when he was killed. I believe he was a good deal older than you. Yes, he was nearly twice my age. I should hardly have imagined that that was altogether satisfactory. No, not altogether. On the other hand, he possessed what was to me at that time an exceptional virtue. And what was that? He wanted to marry me. I see. <laughs> and you? You've been all over the world, I suppose. I heard of you from time to time. Weren't you second secretary in Rome when Michael French was there? Yes, I was. You've enjoyed it all? The travelling, the life, the work? Has it all come up to expectations? I don't know whether enjoyed is the word... I've never regretted my choice of profession, if that's what you mean. Yes, that's what I mean. Oh, it's peaceful here. You must find it a pleasant change from Paris. I'm fond of Paris. One feels at the heart of things. To come back here is like stepping out of the world into a kind of never-never land. People who live permanently in the country seem to inhabit a sort of vegetable world. It's another civilization. Mm, it's everything so slow and quiet. I like that. Evidently, you like Paris, too. I saw you there a few months ago. Oh, where? Dining in a little restaurant near the Madeleine. And you never came to speak to you me. You were not alone. <laughs> Would you expect to find me dining alone in a Paris restaurant? <laughs> what an odd person you are. Well, to be perfectly candid, I didn't think it would be very profitable to either of us to renew a friendship after... 
after so many years. I see. Then my coming here must have embarrassed you. When I accepted your mother's invitation, I didn't know you would be at home. But we are going tomorrow. I've no objection to your coming here, but surely you must understand that in the circumstances, it is a little difficult. Yes, it was nearly tragedy. For a whole day, they were doubtful whether he'd live. You talk about it so calmly. I've lived with it for so long. It's true, then. He attempted suicide. Oh, it's quite true. He poisoned himself with sleeping tablets. Dreadful. For 24 hours, he was on the danger Such list. Such a young man. Yes, he was very young. I really cannot understand how you could possibly... However, no doubt you prefer not to discuss it. Well, there's nothing to discuss. I was to blame entirely. Julian, I must tell you... This morning, the housemaid found six empty gin bottles behind the dressing table in the doctor's room. Now, what am I to do? Ignore it? Oh, why on earth must people drink filthy, disgusting habit? But yet, if I ask him to go, what are we to do? I can't look after the old man. Julian, are you listening? Hmm? Oh, yes, Mother, of course. Well, then what am I to do? Can't you speak to him? Me? Well, you could do it tactfully with your experience. It, it isn't much to ask. Oh, very well, Mother, if you wish. Why should I be plagued by these miserable old men? They spoil everything. Oh, I, I really must put a few scarlet rhododendrons over there to brighten that expanse of mauve. There's a lovely new variety with some name like Eastern Seas. Oh, I can see you're thinking of something quite different, Julian. Excuse me, Mrs. Farrer. Uh, I think you meant to run through the children's school lists before I started packing. Indeed I did, Matty. I'll come now. I think we'll need some new handkerchiefs. Yes, I, I'm afraid you will. Julian, why are you so uncivil to Francis? I really don't understand it. I thought you'd like to see her again, instead of which you simply ignore her. What seems extraordinary to me is that you should invite her here after what happened. It's not extraordinary at all. She's gone through a most unhappy experience. And to whom else should she turn? I elected to bring up that girl because I was fond of her mother. Do you think I can ignore her existence now? She's never been very communicative and I think she's behaved outrageously. All the same, I'm fond of the girl and I don't care what people think. Well, it's hardly a comfortable situation, is it? After all, she and I were brought up together here from the time she was ten years old. There's not a corner of this house and garden that doesn't hold some memory for me of Francis as a child. And naturally, naturally, I've always had a particular sort of affection for her. Well? well what has she turned into now? A woman who takes some stupid youth as a second husband, leaves him after six months, gets involved in his attempted suicide, scandal, divorce... Well, really, it's difficult to imagine that she has anything in common with a girl who used to run in this garden. We're, we're simply strangers. Well, what am I to say to her now? Are we to sit and chat about old times? It's, well, it's embarrassing. Her very name seems to, seems to stick in my throat. How could she bear to come back here? She came because I insisted she should. I thought it might help her. Now I'm beginning to regret it. Oh, you're very like your father in some ways. If I'm being impolite, I'm sorry, I'll apologise. But really, when one thinks... Ever since she left school, her behaviour has been quite incomprehensible to me. I could never understand why she had to rush off and marry Edison before she was out of her teens. He was old enough to be her father. And since the war, if half of what one hears is true... Oh, she... poof! Everybody talks scandal about a pretty widow. Don't be so puritanical. I'm not puritanical. Then you're jealous, perhaps. Jealous? Me? Oh, that's very good. Here comes the doctor with David. Now, please don't say anything about the gin. If he feels he must drink, then drink he shall, and that's all there is to it. took us another four-day steady climb, and there we were, over 19,000 feet up, on the highest pass in the world, looking away north to Tibet. They call it Nangpala. <laughs> Mountain peaks as far as the eye could see, white and barren, like the surface of the moon. Oh. Hmm. Few Europeans have ever made that journey. Hmm. 
In those days, I could walk. Now, sit down, dear, and I'll read to you. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, oh, these damn legs of mine are worn out. Oh, uh, the whole bag of tricks has fallen to pieces. <laughs> and so, from hour to hour, we rot and rot. Oh, he's gone to sleep. Now I can get on with my book. Oh, what a household. Round and round we go, day after day, like elderly goldfish in a bowl. Oh, mark you, I'm not complaining. If your good mother hadn't employed me when she did, I should probably be in a home by now. At uh, one time, you know, I acquired an unfortunate taste. Oh, yes? Yes. Oh, you'd be surprised what a devil of a habit it is to break. Oh, one's disgusted with oneself. One makes up one's mind never to touch the stuff again. But by God, when the craving comes, I tell you, it's... Oh, it's overwhelming. <sighs> yes. People don't quite understand. However, all's well that ends well. You, uh, succeeded? Oh, yes, I mastered it, I'm glad to say. <laughs> Ah, that's a good noise to hear. I'll be perfectly frank with you. I do take a drink occasionally. Yes, I imagined you did. Oh, where's the harm? Cut out every pleasure and one might as well be dead. You're wanted on the telephone, Mr. Anson. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, excuse me. Uh, mm. Can I, I speak to you, Doctor? Oh, uh, go on. What? He's asleep. They were talking about you, he and Gregson. Ah, enumerating my virtues. Gregson was saying you were unsuitable to stay here because you drink. You saw what I drank at dinner last night, barley water. And what was it you had before you came downstairs that made you so talkative and your face so red? Was that barley water? Oh. Well, why do you take us all for fools? Well, let them sack me. What do I care? You've taken a drink just now. I can always tell. I felt dreadful this morning. You wouldn't understand, of course. What will become of you? Where will you go? How will you live? You, you'll just end in the gutter. Well, who cares? I do. It, it's terrible to see an, an educated man slipping into degradation. Have you no willpower? I mean, surely, for your own self-respect... Oh, you... this damned Scottish Calvinism. Man has a couple of drinks and it's a tragedy. Degradation? Leave me alone, will you? It seems I'm very clumsy. I meant to help you, to encourage you, and, and I only succeed in making you angry. Oh, girl, I'm not angry. You're a good girl. Don't take it to heart. Bless you, it's not worth a frown to anybody. You've got a pretty face. Now, let's see it smile. Don't touch me. Oh, what's the use? Oh... Oh, my dear girl. There's something wrong with Mattie. She looks as if she was crying. It's nothing. She hasn't been looking well lately. I've asked her twice to see a doctor. Uh, how old is she? Uh, 35. She's been with me seven years. And all that time, I don't believe she's made a friend or had an admirer. I feel sorry for her. Yes, there it is. God knows some of us make fools of ourselves, fall in love stupidly, marry the wrong person, are disappointed, suffer. But, Lord, better that a thousand times than to be 35 and still waiting, waiting. She's been so loyal to me in spite of everything. But lately I've noticed her looking at me in an odd way, as if she hated me. Well, perhaps she does. The fact is, there's no equality of opportunity in sex, no fair shares for all. She's one of the have-nots. She's probably envious. Envious? When if she knew how gladly I'd have changed places with her sometimes. I dare say, sometimes. Oh, you think me hypocritical. Oh, I don't deny I've sought admiration and enjoyed it. But I never thought that one day I'd become the sort of woman that respectable people are embarrassed to meet. You don't embarrass me. I'm not offensively respectable. Well, mark you, I wasn't struck off the register or anything of that kind. Of course not. There's no of course not about it. One night, I was called out to a case when I was drunk. I blundered out to the car, drove five miles, swerved all over the road, 
And what happened? Nothing. Nothing at all. Well, we all take risks, my dear girl. And as long as we're lucky, we're respectable. Use every man after his deserts, and who shall escape whipping? There'll be no more risks for me from now on that, I promise you. Never again. Never is a long time. I mean it, never. Now, where has Julian gone? He was wanted on the telephone. Oh, why can't they leave him alone? You know, he used to be quite interested in the place. But now his heart's in Whitehall. Oh, I've no illusions. When I die, he'll sell it. It's disappointing. What where are the children? Uh, uh, Corey! Uh, Corey! Toby! Nelly! That was Humphrey Caldwell. He hopes to be here about three o'clock. Who is he exactly, dear? And what does he do? We were in Stockholm together some years ago. Now he's head of the personnel department. Mm. His brother has a house in Dorchester. I... I couldn't quite make out why he wanted to see me. As a diplomat, he would naturally be reluctant to make himself clear. I'm afraid it may mean that I shan't be able to stay here very long. You've only just arrived and now you're talking of going. Oh, it's all such nonsense. No, here they are. Well, dears, what have you been doing? The cat has just killed a bird. Oh, the wretch! Look, a young thrush. Oh, what a shame. We chased the cat and shouted. But the bird was dead. It just fluttered in my hand for a few seconds and then it died. And the cat shan't have it anyway. Certainly not. Now come with me and I'll show you where you can bury it deep in the ground and safe from the, any cat. Yes. And you know, we're all going to the beach this afternoon for a picnic. Oh, lovely. Do you think we could make it a tombstone? Yes, oh, there you are. There's nature for you. Red in tooth and claw. And that's a nice pussy cat too. A gentle, friendly, furry creature. But show her a bird or a mouse, and she's a murderess, a ruthless killer. Yes, it's horrid. Ah, but don't forget the other side of the picture. Think of the poor, innocent little worms that that pretty bird would have torn from the ground with its cruel beak and swallowed alive. Murder most foul, wherever you look. <sighs> yes, and what about man? He's tarred with the same brush. The instinct's there. Give him an excuse. Dress him up in a uniform, tell him he's a hero, and he'll go out and kill with no more conscience than that cat. Oh, you look as if you didn't altogether agree with me. I hardly imagined you were serious. To draw an analogy between a cat killing a bird and nations going to war? Well, really, Doctor, isn't that a little far-fetched? Oh, what's a nation? Just a pack, just a herd, ready to follow the loudest voice or the sharpest teeth? Let's have no illusions. We inhabit a jungle. Wolves, that's all. Oh! <coughs> Damned noise. <coughs> I'm sorry, old man. We were having a discussion. There's no need to howl like a blasted hyena. It was a wolf. Oh. oh. Mm. Uh, it's no good. <clears throat> I'm for the individual. Mm. For instance, I like talking to you. I like talking to Mrs. Farrow here. I recognize civilized, intelligent persons with whom one can reason, joke and argue. But put two million of you together, and I'd hate the sight of you. Now, take my advice. Leave the masses alone. You're wasting your time, my dear fellow. You might as well go and bang your head against that tree. Oh, thank you very much, Doctor. Oh, you don't believe me, of course. You're an idealist. I know, I know. You'd much better resign, believe me. I can suggest a dozen better jobs. Very kind of you. Ah, uh, I was an idealist once. Now, I'm an Epicurean. I think I might guess what you are, Mrs. Sarah. Easily. I'm a middle-aged widow trying to bring up two children without very much money. And don't expect me to answer philosophical problems, please. Just as I thought. A good, sensible materialist. My congratulations. I dare say David here might be on your side, the mountaineer. He's spent all his life toiling after the inaccessible, too. Uh, if, if someone would tell me what the fool's talking about... He's I... talking nonsense, Uncle. Oh, oh. nonsense, you think? Oh. Oh. And suppose I tell you that you and your kind are dangerous meddlers. Oh, oh, don't be so stupid. You play with matters you don't understand, and what happens? Other people suffer for your mistakes. Yes, you're not as clever as you think. Doctor! It's true. They don't know what they're doing. They plot and plan, confer and scheme, sign treaties, build armies. And where does it get us all in the end? 
You're ignorant, the whole lot of you. You don't know what you're doing. You strut and pose and play your games and other people pay. Yes, that's the end of it. Young men die, and you can't deny it. This is intolerable. Doctor, please. Infernal bore. Oh, no, no. No, don't go. Please. I apologize. No, don't go. I was just talking. I didn't mean it. Uh, the fact is, I... Oh, I've had a drink or two. You see, and... Uh, well, then one talks. Oh, don't go, please. Then I suggest we change the subject. Yes, yes, of course. I talk too much, I'm sorry. I won't say another word. Uh, there was a huge moth in my room this morning. It had greenish wings and stripes, and there was a reddish color on the underwing. Uh, now, uh, what would that be, hmm? Uh, what do you say? It might have been a poplar hawk moth, Uncle. Uh, yes, 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 that's possible. We used often to find them in the garden in May, mm. sometimes on the trunk of that tree. Do you remember, Francis? Yes. I used to collect moths when I was a boy. I still remember some of the names, though. It's a longish time ago. I was born in 1897. My birthday falls a rather a curious date. November the 11th. So, by the inescapable logic of arithmetic, I was exactly 21 on Armistice Day 1918. You'd scarcely remember that, I suppose, Julian. Vaguely. Flags in the village, I remember, and bells. That's right. Flags and bells. And I was 21. Of course, it all seemed very significant of something or other. Oh, yes, a new era seemed to be dawning for me, for the whole world. When my son was born some years later, I actually said to my wife... He's a lucky little devil, I said, to come into the world in 1924, with all the horrors of war behind him. Hey, in those days, of course, nobody dreamed, even in their wildest nightmares. But surely, in spite of everything, we go forward, if only by infinitely slow and painful stages. Surely there's evidence of that. Oh, it won't be in our time, Doctor, but these children, for instance, or their children, perhaps, may actually live to see a world in which war is spoken of, as we speak today, of burnings at the stake, as something that had its place in a barbarous age and is now unthinkable, impossibly obscene. I can't believe that man is doomed to destroy himself. I can't believe it. We must work patiently. We must have faith. You're getting quite eloquent, dear. We must find you a soapbox, then you can get it all off your chest in Hyde Park. I beg your pardon. I'd forgotten that such subjects were taboo in this house. Excuse me. Oh, no, I suppose he's offended. But I do get tired of these highfalutin speeches, this everlasting talk of politics and war. Can you never find something agreeable to talk about? Why must we have these wearisome world problems dragged into the garden amongst the flowers. Oh, really, I won't have it. Well, it was my fault. I started it. Well, it was very stupid of you, Doctor. You ought to know better. I remember when he was young, when he was still at school, how excitedly he'd talk when something fired his imagination. Quite often I didn't understand half of what he was saying, but I was perfectly happy just to sit listening and watching, especially when he was indignant or delighted. And the words would come tumbling out, and his eyes were shining. <laughs> and you can imagine what the poor man suffered, Mr. Caldwell, inside his costume. <laughs> Dreadful. I didn't catch that. What was inside his costume? A jellyfish, Uncle David. Ah, thank you. Very amusing. <laughs> very amusing. <laughs> there was a very strong bloater in that paste. Uh, more tea, please, Matty. Oh, there's not very much, I'm afraid. I saw rather an attractive-looking pub on the top of the cliff. Caldwell, you interest me strangely. I remember once Look, when... Look, there's a porpoise! Oh, they're very 
very graceful. Uh, as you should see them when they get among salmon at the mouth of a river. They, they fly through the waves like torpedoes. And you, you see the unfortunate salmon jumping high out of the water to escape them. Uh, of course, a porpoise is a mammal. What is a mammal exactly, Matty? I'll tell you later, dear. Nellie, if you and Toby are finished, I'm sure Mrs. Anson would excuse you. Oh, of course, of course. Off you go. Oh, thank you. Thank thank you. you. Be careful of the slippery rocks. There they go. Gradually, one forgets how it used to feel when one could run like that, flying along, hardly conscious of one's body at all. Now, last year, we took the children to a little place in Brittany. We simply lived in bathing suits. Ah, oh, you're a married man, Mr. Caldwell. You've got interests outside your work. Oh. oh, I wish you could persuade Julian to marry and stop him working so hard. Oh, marriage is mother's panacea for everything. If only I were married, I should be more successful, richer, <laughs> taller, more handsome. You can laugh, my dear boy, <laughs> but you work too hard. In the old days, at a picnic like this, he used to be the life and soul of the party. Who? Me? It's true. Isn't it, Francis? Yes. I remember him sitting there, exactly where he is now, juggling with tennis balls. Juggling? Oh, you must be thinking of someone else. I never juggled in my life. You can <laughs> deny it, but it's true. <laughs> this chair is very uncomfortable. If, if you'll excuse me, I, I'll just go and keep an eye on them. Thank you, Matty. The children will miss her. Yes, they will. And I know somebody she'll miss. The doctor. Oh, me? Oh, ridiculous. <laughs> oh, I keep my eyes open. Francis, if you've digested your tea, we'll take David for a stroll and leave these men to talk politics. Uh, Mother, I... And to think they get paid for their clumsy blunderings. My cook could do as well. Uh, the cook's not bad. She can't do rice, though. What's wrong with her rice, dear? This is something quite new. It's sloppy. Oh, come now. Now, we'll all go for a walk. We shall give you about ten minutes, Mr. Caldwell, and then we shall come chattering back and disturb you again. <laughs> uh, no, no, that way, Francis, dear. Oh, right. Um, uh, uh, come along, Doctor. Oh, I don't like to be beside the season. Well, I hope I haven't spoiled the picnic by coming over. Well, not at all, Caldwell. I tried to arrange that you and I should stay at home, but my mother was very anxious that we should come. I'm home so seldom... I didn't like to disappoint you. No, well, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> House by the sea. I've always dreamed of that. As I happened to be down here, I thought I'd take the opportunity of having a chat with you. It's nothing of any great importance, anyway. What is it? Well, we had a conference last week to make a few staff appointments and changes. Yes. Amongst other things, the question of extending your appointment in Paris cropped up. My appointment? Well, how do you mean? Surely that was settled months ago. Uh, yes, that's Well, the true, ambassador but... was perfectly agreeable, and I had your letter confirming it. I really can't see why the question was raised. Ah, well, um, you understand. In the ordinary course of events, your term in Paris would finish about the end of the month. Yes, of course, I know that perfectly well. Uh, well, we... We rather... Um, we came to the conclusion that it might be as well in the circumstances... Uh, not to interfere with the normal routine replacement arrangements. Do you mean... Uh, yes, we are going to bring you home at the end of the month. Uh, you'll get an official notification, of course. But it's senseless. I took all the trouble to explain. You know perfectly well I'm serving on the refugee committee and shall be until the end of September. Uh, yes, I know. Then why? Uh, extensions do mean a certain amount of disorganization on the establishment. Oh, side. rubbish, man. That was all settled months ago. I cannot leave Paris yet. It's out of the question. I have important matters to deal with, and I cannot leave. Uh, yes, but uh, well, it's, it's difficult, Julia. Difficult? And do you think it's going to be easy for Shepparton to take over from me at this moment? Well, we discussed it very fully before coming to a decision, I assure you. Of course, there's some reason for this. Oh, it's just an ordinary matter of staff readjustment. Do you think I believe that? At least give me some credit for not being a fool. Look, really, Julian, I don't think you want to look for some sinister design behind what is, after all... Oh, for only... God's sake, Caldwell, stop being tactful. I'm sorry. But surely we know each other well enough. Can't we forget our official positions just for a moment? Yes, of course. It was agreed that I should stay on so long as the committee was sitting. And that's a perfectly normal arrangement. 
If you've changed your mind, it's because for some reason or other you're determined not to keep me in Paris a moment longer than is absolutely necessary. It has nothing to do with establishment difficulties. It's evidently a question of my own personal inadequacy. Oh, look I, here. You, you, you're, you're simply imagining things, Julian. But there's really no point in bringing up this kind of thing. Each of us has his own personality and idiosyncrasies. And since these can't be changed, I never see that there's much to be gained by discussing them. You've got a very good brain, for instance. But then you don't happen to be the kind who goes out of his way to make himself agreeable. I've no time for stupidity and incompetence, if that's what you mean. Well, certainly your standards are very high. Is that a reproach? Of course not. The fact is, I suppose, that in our profession, a man's usefulness may depend to a certain extent on the success of his personal relations. Quite so. In plain language, they dislike me in Paris. You know, you're putting words into my mouth that I had no intention of using. Oh, split hairs, if you must, but the truth is, I'm unpopular. Do you think I don't know what they say of me behind my back? I'm unpopular. And unsuccessful. Well, I should hardly describe your career as unsuccessful. Although we can't actually give you a department at the moment, I feel fairly certain that before... Oh, long... my dear. Oh, please. Well, look at me if it comes to that. I haven't exactly set the Thames on fire. But isn't that the same in every profession? There isn't room for everybody at the top of the tree. And we all have a great regard for your integrity. Haven't I worked... Damnation! Haven't I worked? Yes, you know, that's just it. Some of us think you work too hard. Uh, for instance, you're entitled to 56 days leave a year. Have you ever taken it? Last year, you had 29. I was busy, as you know. It was the and... same when you were in Stockholm, I remember. You don't play games, do you? And I know you're not one for entertainment. I didn't join the Foreign Office for its social amenities. <laughs> really, Julian? Well, it gets on my nerves to see them all so infernally sedate. Talk about British phlegm. People profess to find it a virtue, but to me there's nothing more exasperating. Why, only take Maynard and his pipe, for instance. Go to him for the simplest decision, and what happens? Always the same interminable pantomime. Ums and ahs, and clouds of blue smoke, and the whole world can wait while he fiddles and sucks and chews and blows and dribbles. If they dislike me, let me tell you what I think of them. They're second rate, the whole lot of them. Second rate. Well, I dare say that's true, according to your standards. For the matter of that, the vast majority of human beings are second rate. Now, look. Can an older man give you a word of advice? Don't expect so much. Try to live in the world as it is. And not dream all the time of what it may be in 500 years, when we're all of us wiser and kinder and cleverer. What do you propose to do with me? Well, for the time being, you'll be attached to the permanent undersecretary's department. Where I can do no harm. Oh, God. I object to being treated like this. You're simply recalling me as if I were an incompetent clerk. Oh. And why? Because I work too hard, if you please. Well, why should I accept this decision? No. I shall see the ambassador. I shall appeal against it. It's grotesque. Oh, come now. Oh, please. leave me alone. No. To hear this kind of news no. at a picnic. No. Well, it's a bit incongruous among the donuts. I'm really very sorry. But I hope you won't take it too much to heart. Oh, no, no, of course not. No, the truth is, it's not so much leaving Paris that matters to me. It's just that now I understand Colville. Now I understand exactly what my position is. <laughs> well, at 40, it's about time to come to one's senses. Don't you think that you're rather exaggerating the importance of this affair? Very likely. The plain truth is that I've exaggerated the importance of my whole career. It's a misfortune in life to be a success at 21. Just win a few scholarships at the varsity, you know, the old fools nod their heads and say, Ah, you've got a splendid future before you, my boy. And at that age, too, of course, one believes it. Nothing's out of reach. One sees oneself working miracles. It's amusing to consider the reality. First secretary, and a misfit at that. Yes, a lot of your work has been greatly appreciated, I assure you. Oh, thank you, Colville. Thank you. Look, you need a change. I suggest you take a month's leave pretty soon. Change? Yes, you're right. 
Yes, by heaven, it's time for that. When I think of the way I've lived, and for what? People call me clever. But what have I to show for my 40 years of life? Why, the first fool you stopped in the street with a home of his own and a wife and a dog would have more to boast of than I. Well, what have I? Oh, a lot of his work was greatly appreciated. Epitaph on a well-meaning civil servant. Do you see the children playing? <clears throat> when one is young, one looks at the world, touches it, and enjoys it. But as one grows older, so gradually one turns away from it, scarcely sees it from one year's end to the next. I've been in America, Sweden, Italy, France, and all I've seen, all I've touched, is another office desk, a different sort of ink pot. <laughs> That's true. This sun, the air, the sky's brightness. I've taken care to shut myself away from them for fear they should distract me from the business of meddling in humanity's affairs. Think of the stupidity. Deliberately to shun all wonder, all pleasure, even love itself. Isn't that to qualify for a madhouse? You're still a young man. You've time. Time. Yes, but what if I wished it? What if I lost? Please. Oh, I, w I wonder if you'd mind putting these in your pocket until we get home. I've nowhere safe to put them and they keep dropping out of my hand. Shells. Yes, yes, I'll look after them. Thank you. There are six periwinkles and 14 cowries. Oh, and one dog whelk. Thank you. Toby, wait for me. Yes, well, uh, I must be getting along or I shall miss my train. Go gather by the humming sea some twisted echo harboring shell. Years ago, when their mother was quite young, she and I, she and I, I'll come with you up to the house. There. He's asleep again. <laughs> Go on, dear. Tell me. That summer I was 28. He'd been away off and on for so long that his death made hardly any difference to my life. I wrote one letter less a week, that's all. Oh, of course, I was sad for a time. But I always had it at the back of my mind I'd marry again. Why shouldn't you? You were quite young. And the truth is I wanted to be admired and courted. <laughs> I wanted to find a husband, so I started to look for one. I did it quite deliberately. Perhaps that's why I wasn't very successful. Meanwhile, the years were passing. Then you met Farah? Yes. As he came to live in the flat opposite mine. We used to meet in the lift occasionally, and I never even looked at him. Oh, why should I? He was years younger than I. A boy. It was weeks before I discovered he used to wait and listen for my door to open and then step out to meet me. Eventually I snubbed him, oh, quite mildly, but he blushed and stammered and was so apologetic I felt I'd been too unkind, so a day or two later I invited him in for a drink with some friends. Ah, yes, of course. And from that day he never left me alone. He sent me flowers, he sent me books and invitations even copied out bits of Shakespeare and Ronsard and pushed them under my door. Couldn't you discourage him in some way? Oh, I said all the usual things. I was far too old, we must just be friends. I meant it too at first. And then gradually, as he insisted, I began to think, well, after all, perhaps... My dear girl... Mm. 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 Did you say something? N nothing, dear. Mm. Chatter, chatter, chatter. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Nothing, dear. He can't hear. I suppose I was flattered. 
I was tired of living alone and told myself that other women had married men much younger than themselves. It isn't invariably disastrous, surely. If only you'd come to me for advice. Mm, you've made up your mind to do something stupid. You avoid good advice. Oh, I knew it was stupid, but I couldn't stop. And so we were married. He'd have been happy enough with a girl of 21. But with a widow of 36... He didn't seem able to treat me as an ordinary creature of flesh and blood. For a woman of my age, it was simply embarrassing. And when I tried to bring him down to earth, I could see he was hurt, shocked. Yes. After three or four months, the situation was so getting on my nerves, I could hardly speak politely to him or bear him near me. At last, I told him that I was afraid we'd made a mistake, that I was to blame. I'd go give him a divorce and arrange for everything. He kept saying, but what have I done? What have I done? A few days later, they found him unconscious, and a long letter that was published in the papers in which he forgave me. People read about these things, but no one understands. Oh, I know I deserved it all, but did he? What will become of him? One thinks one lives in a vacuum, that one sins are one's own concern, but that's not true. Ah, uh, Julian, dear, uh, what have you been doing? Nothing. Nothing. I hope Mr. What's-his-name hasn't ordered you off to Timbuktu by the next train. No, no, quite the reverse. I'm being recalled to London. I thought you were to stay in Paris for another six months. That was the arrangement, yes. Then why has it been altered? Are they promoting you, dear? Well, it's certainly high time. Not exactly, no. Of course, no one can expect to understand the machinations of the Foreign Office. But aren't they pleased with your work, or what? Oh, simply delighted. Then why, may one Really, ask? Mother, it's not worth discussing. I dare say I've trodden on a few toes, that's all. I must say, I think they treat you quite disgracefully, considering the way you work, never sparing yourself, never taking proper holidays. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, what's the matter? What's happened? Never mind, dear. Uh, Why uh, don't you appeal? Appeal? It's merely a routine move. Besides, I'm perfectly satisfied. They were a dull lot in Paris. I should be glad of a change. It's not bad news at all. On the contrary. How much longer are we going to sit here? What did I say? Do you want to go home, dear? Yes, I do. Doctor? Where on earth is he? Uh, Doctor! I bet you half a crown is with Gregson in the pub. I might have known this would happen. Why we go on employing anyone so hopelessly unreliable? It's simply throwing money away. Oh, he's all right. Well, it's all very well to say that. Let me take him for you. No, dear, you please stay here. He's my responsibility. Now, come, dear. Uh, and when the uh, doctor comes, Julian, tell him we wanted him and he wasn't there. I, I don't want to upset anyone. Perhaps we should all go. Uh, I'll call the children. Certainly not. Now, the children are enjoying themselves. <laughs> I told you it was going to be a long day, but you wouldn't uh, listen to me. There must be an end it to it. Okay. <laughs> For years, my mother has been telling me that I work too hard. And now, when she's proved to be perfectly right, she's indignant. Does that surprise you? You don't know much about human nature. No, perhaps not. I had no business to speak to you as I did this morning. I hope you'll forgive me. Of course. Do you know how long it is since you and I were together on this beach? It's nearly 20 years. Nothing's changed. People who think their lives important should look at rocks. Rocks that have stood, say, for 400 million years. It's pathetic, isn't it, to think how long some of us continue to deceive ourselves. Of course, my leaving Paris will not make the slightest difference to anybody or anything. I always thought it was the wrong profession for you. You should have been a painter or a writer and worked off all your romantic notions harmlessly on paper. Look! Look! I found this in a pool. What is it, darling? It's called Acidian, Matty says. Oh, yes, Acidian. Um, is Matty really leaving? Yes, darling, she's going to her sister. When? Tomorrow, when you go back to school. Can she come back sometimes? Yes, I expect she can, if you'd like her to. Yes, I should. When can she come? Can she come next summer, next summer holidays? Mm, yes, I dare say. Yes, I dare say she could come for a week or so next summer. Do you mind if I tell her that? No, you tell her if you'd like to. Oh, thank well, you. Don't go too far away. We'll be leaving soon. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Mappy! <laughs> She's an attractive child. What will become of her? 
Has she a friendly star? I often wonder. When I went to Washington, you were still a schoolgirl. Hearing of your engagement came as quite a shock. I was 19. Yes, I know. All the same, it seemed absurdly young. Nobody could be expected to know their own mind at that age. Mm, I did. I confess it rather annoyed me at the time. Well, how many men had you met and why the hurry? Of course, it was none of my business. I realised that. And in any case, I could hardly have interfered from the other side of the world. And suppose you'd been here. How would you have interfered? I've always been obstinate, you know. At least we might have discussed it sensibly. A sensible discussion. Do you think that would have made any difference? You know how one daydreams. Imagining what might have happened had one made some different decision at some time. Well, I've wondered occasionally how you would have answered if I'd asked you years ago to marry me. Years ago? Say, before you met Miles Edison. Oh, then. Oh, well, then I'd have married you if you lifted your little finger. Is that true? True? Oh, Judy, don't be ridiculous. Surely you knew. But of course I didn't. Oh, and the trouble I took to please you. But I never thought <laughs> no, that you... Of course not. Why should you? There was so much else to excite and interest you in those days. I remember the morning you had the notice of your appointment in Washington. How delighted you were. Everyone said how splendid it was, and all I could think of was that it was 3,000 miles away and that I'd lost you. I didn't know. Oh, I... No, you didn't know. I remember we went to Southampton to see you off. You kissed your mother goodbye, and then, for some reason or other, you turned to me, gave my hair a little pull, and said, Goodbye, behave yourself. <laughs> that was as near as I ever got to a kiss from you. But surely you knew I was fond of you. Fond? Where are you fond? Oh, if only I'd been fond and not lost, not damned past saving in love. But our whole lives might have been entirely different if only oh, I'd realised. If, if. That's a silly game to play. Here comes the doctor and Gregson. Oh, those boring old men. Let's go. No, I think we'll stay. No, why? Come for a walk with me, please. Please. No, Julian, no. Why not? Well, I never saw her again until she died. I'm talking about my sister, Mrs. Farrah. And, and he actually came up to see me in the hospital. And, and, and said, now I hope you're pleased with yourself. <laughs> That's true. Dreadful. It's been going on like this for 20 minutes. It's all very well to sneer, but what would you have done? I mean, imagine it. Your own sister dying in poverty. Oh, why think about it, my dear fellow? It doesn't help. She might be walking the earth today. Ah, uh, she's probably much happier where she is. That's what I tell him. Of course she's happier, far happier. What's the matter? Is he hurt? It's his sister. His sister? Mm. What do you mean? She died years ago. Exactly. That's just it. Uh, sometimes it comes back to me. I just can't help it. Really, Willie, come now. You've been giving him drink, Doctor. One glass of beer. Well, you know what he's like. Now, that's quite enough, Willie. Yes. You mm. did all you could for your sister. We've been through the whole story before several times. May you please cheer up. I'll try. Well, we're here to enjoy ourselves. A beautiful evening like this, too. Meanwhile, since you were nowhere to be seen, Doctor, I had to take the old man home myself. Oh, I'm sorry. You might think. I beg your pardon. Excuse me, Mrs. Anson. I, I'm afraid we've lost the kite. The wind dropped as Toby was pulling it in, and it swooped down and stuck halfway up the cliff. You, you can see it from here. Oh, dear, yes. What a nuisance. Something like this always happens just when one wants to go home. Can't we climb up to it? If the old man was here, he'd be up that cliff. I think I can get it. Yeah, of course you can. Of course you can do nothing of the sort. You're not a climber. One slip, and where would you be? I've climbed these cliffs a dozen times. I dare say, when you were young. Well, I'm still under 80, Mother. It doesn't look particularly difficult. But Julian, will you please oblige me by not being stupid and obstinate? Nobody need be alarmed. Broken legs are my speciality. That's not funny. J Julian, dear... I forbid you to do it. It's so steep. This way to the amazing exhibition. Daredevil diplomat dices with death. Doctor. Uh, what? Uh, yes? Hmm? Uh, may I speak to you? Uh, what now? Uh, there won't be another chance. Oh, very well. Speak on. You have our ear. Please don't joke. Oh, my dear girl, what is it? You're trembling. Uh, don't laugh, that's all. Of course not. Come and sit down. No, I, I'd prefer to stand with no time. Uh, doctor, 
It may not be very long before your employment here is ended. Well, uh, yes, that is so. I believe you are quite alone in the world. True. So you'd have nowhere to go from here? Oh, as to that, a nomad existence suits me. I'm an independent old cuss. Doctor, would you not consider letting me make a home for you? Oh, my dear girl. I'd not interfere with you. You could come and go as you liked if you wanted to drink, if it gave you any pleasure. I'd not try to stop you by lecturing or nagging, as long as I could look after you and make a home where you were comfortable. Uh, Matty, uh, Matty, please, I beg you. My dear girl, you're not thinking what you're saying. It's out of the question. Why, consider our ages. I'm 35. Exactly. I'm 56, 21 years older. You're a fine young woman. You should be thinking of a man who could offer you some sort of future. A young fellow with energy and prospects. Do you think there are many young fellows with energy and prospects who'd want to marry a penniless governess of 35? Oh, when I say young... I've never uh, had a proposal of marriage in my life, not one. Of course, I'm not pretty. but Uglier women than I get married, plenty of them. Oh. Maybe... maybe I've not the right way of speaking to men. My sister always says I'm too solemn, too serious, and I dare say she's right. But I might never to be married because I've no great sense of humour. And what have I to joke about, will you tell me? Now, now, Matty. Some women, some women have only to lift their eyes and take a pick of a dozen look at her. How many men has she had, and young, too? It, it's not fair. Shh, now, now, there. Shh, shh. Oh, sorry, sorry. I just thought, before it was too late, I, I might as well offer to live for someone who'd not be too particular, perhaps. Not too particular? Oh, this is simply unheard of. Well, what can I say? You don't need to say anything. I'm not so dense, I can't understand. Could I let you throw yourself away on a waster, a drunkard? Look at me. A nice sort of bridegroom I'd make for any woman. What do I care that you're poor or a drunkard? You're kind, gentle, understanding, and, and you'd be someone that belonged to me at last. You'd be mine. If you knew how tired I am of... Loving other people's children and losing them and starting again. And, and never a soul that's mine to keep. Oh, come now, come. <laughs> now, let's talk this over calmly. Now, let me say, first of all, that I don't see in your situation any need for such desperate remedies as you suggest. Because a young woman has reached the age of 35... That's no reason why she should throw herself away on an old fool who could be no help or comfort why to her. Why do you speak of yourself like that? Because it's true. I've had my life, marriage, a career, a child. I've had it all. In what's to come, I am not particularly interested. Oh. And to live with a man who's uninterested in life would be dreadful, depressing. But at 35, good heavens, there's hope. <laughs> A chance meeting, a letter, some trivial little incident may suddenly transform your whole life. And I believe it will. Yes, I have a strong conviction that your star is in the ascendant. You're very kind. Your day will come. I'm certain of it. You know, there's a certain sort of tree that only flowers every 12 years, or 10 perhaps, I forget which... And so it is with certain lives. For years, they're grey and monotonous, and then, one day, unexpectedly, they blossom out in happiness. Oh, oh yes, he's rescued the kite. Oh, how absurd. You can see he's quite delighted with himself. Oh, very clever, very daring. Oh, why didn't you come? Why didn't you? Halfway up, we all thought he wasn't going to be able to get any higher, and then he We just should went... start packing up now, dear. It's nearly seven o'clock. 
that little bush hadn't been there, what would you have done? I should have rolled down the cliff. <laughs> rolled down the cliff, rolled down the cliff. What a feat. Now for Everest. I still say it was very stupid. Just one slip and look at his trousers ruined. Oh, that's nothing. I think we could mend that. Yeah, there, you see. Willing hands attend to the hero's every need. What can I do? Surely you require some medical attention? <laughs> Let me feel your pulse. 98, 99, 100. He's alive. Right. <laughs> Shush, darling, you're too excited. It's clear that I should have been a mountaineer. I've wasted my life, Doctor. <laughs> now, pack up, please. Pack up, children. It's time to go. That was a shabby trick you played on me, Doctor. Very shabby. What do you mean? There was something in that beer. Oh, don't be such an ass. Willie, hmm? your spectacle case. Was, uh, oh, oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Julian, take the rug, dear. Yes, Mother. Uh, bring the chair, Doctor. Uh. Come on, everybody! Holy mouse to Babylon, breeze haunting. Next summer, shall we be able to go to the sea? Shall we? Perhaps, darling. We'll see. It's all right. I asked Maggie and she said you could come. Next summer! Good morning, Doctor. Oh, good morning. Look at this flower. There used to be a lot in the wood, owing to the heavy clay soil. It's called Herb Robert, or Geranium Robertianum. The uh, leaf has a rather peculiar scent. Mm. I don't care for it. <laughs> it's pungent, certainly. Oh, it looks as if there'll be more trouble in the east. Mm, oh, very likely. You know, I got up early this morning and went for a walk. Everything was absolutely motionless, as if asleep. The light wasn't bright like this, but gold. And the shadow of that tree stretched all across the lawn. Such stillness. Why get up early? Couldn't you sleep? No. Doctor, I must tell you something. I have decided to marry. Oh, what? Yes. All last night I thought of what my future was to be, and at last it became absolutely clear. No more ambitions for public life with its arid frustrations. Marriage, a home, children. Does this mean you approve of marriage in a general way, or that your affections are already fixed on some particular object? Well, of course they are. There's only one person in the world I would dream of marrying. Francis Farrer. Oh, my dear boy. Well? Oh, nothing. She's a fine woman, woman of the world. She has courage and dignity. I congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you. You're a good fellow. Oh, I feel so absurdly excited. Have you declared yourself? Well, I've had no opportunity yet, but I mean to speak to her presently. She has suffered a great deal. You can see it in her face and movements. And hear it in her voice. And do you know who is partly responsible? I am. You? Yes. For the way she's lived, for the way she's suffered. I'm very much to blame, Doctor. I realise that now perfectly well. Oh, we're all involved, my dear boy, one with another. We're all involved. It's extraordinary. When I first saw her again, I only thought that she looked older. But yesterday, on the beach, her face seemed to have changed and grown more beautiful. Oh, that's very extraordinary, of course. Um, have you got two ten-shilling notes for a pound, by any chance? I might have. Yes. Here. Thank you. Ah, I see. What? Oh, when a man wants to make himself agreeable to a widow, he starts by bribing the children. <laughs> how is David this morning, Doctor? Oh, he's all right. How can you say that when last night he nearly collapsed? Oh, you know, he's a very old gentleman. We shall have these frights from time to time. Probably the sun was too much for him. Oh, it worried me. I couldn't sleep all night. I kept thinking, suppose he dies in his sleep. Suppose I never can speak to him again. I, I should never have forgiven myself. He wanted to come with us. It would have been unkind to have left him at home. It wasn't your fault, Mother. No, you don't understand, dear. I've been so short-tempered with him, so quick and impatient. How can he help being slow and deaf and easily tired? He's coming to the end of his days, and we must never forget that. God knows his life is dull enough. 
He has no one of his own generation to talk to, no one's interested in his stories, and if he makes an attempt to join in the life that's going on round him, he is soon made to understand that he's a nuisance, in a way. It's so cruel. Age, I do abhor thee. That's the law. Now, please don't say that. I don't like it. It's Shakespeare. I don't care who it is. Uh, oughtn't he to have a heart tonic? No. Doctor, are you thinking what you say? You can always flog a tired horse, but you can't prolong its life. His heart is old, that's all, like the rest of him. Of course, if you care to call in another opinion... Oh, no, no, no. Uh, you uh, do usually help him to dress, don't you? Why, well, fasten his shoes and pull on his trousers. He likes to do the rest himself. Well, perhaps this morning he was so tired last night, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, as you wish. Why are you up so early, dear? I couldn't sleep either. I was restless. We must be friends, Julia. Of course, Mother, of course. I was worrying so much last night about your future. There's nothing to worry about. You say that, dear, but I think otherwise. You must remember you're 40 now. I don't like to think of you going on into middle age unsuccessful and alone. Such a bleak outlook. Independence is all very well for a young man, but as you grow older, you will find it's just another name for loneliness. Mother, I'm I... talking, Julian. I'm sorry, but could we discuss all that later? Do you mind? Yes, I do mind. I'm speaking for your own good, and I'll be grateful if you'll allow me to finish. Oh, I beg your pardon. You think me a fool, of course, because I, I don't happen to interest myself in politics. Nothing that I say is worth your attention. Oh, the, the, there's a spider on your collar. Oh, take it away. Mm. There, it's gone. Why won't you let me help you, dear? Why? You'll never make an effort on your own behalf, but now that you've to be at home for a time, I could easily do some entertaining for you. I should enjoy it. And you could meet a few nice people. For instance, however long is it since you've seen the Clintons? Elizabeth is 26 now, and she's grown into such an attractive creature. Uh, yes, I dare say. Very but well, I... then I shall arrange Mother, it. will you please try to understand that I am not interested in Elizabeth Clinton? Oh, I can see what it is. You'll never marry, never. Mother, You'll simply I... end up as one of those pathetic creatures who spend their days in clubs for company and go home night after night to empty flats. Very well, I shall say no more. But if you imagine that's a happy way to live... Uh, yeah, well, what is it, Willie? We were having a private conversation. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, it was just these plans. Excuse me, excuse me. Oh, you needn't go. Now, we've finished. Oh, oh, oh thank you. Thank you. Oh, now, uh, I said I'd show you these plans in the estimate. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, the pigsty. The scale is one inch to one foot. Now, here, for instance, is the sectional view. And you can see the rather complicated drainage system. Uh, yes, I suppose so. That's all very well, but how much will it cost? The estimate is £105, but I dare oh, say... Oh, out of the question. Perfectly absurd. Why should he have such a luxurious pigsty? I understood that you had more or less promised him. Then I've changed my mind. £105, indeed? Well, for half that, he could buy enough pork to last him for the rest of his life. Yes, but one can't promise a person a pigsty one minute and then simply change one's mind the oh, next. All right, all right. Now, let him have it. That's your money, after all, and not mine. Let him have it by all means. And don't let's discuss it anymore. Oh, very well. I'm tired of it all. Yes, I'm tired. There's everlasting struggle year after year to keep the place in some sort of order. And for whom? I fuss about, make plans, spend money, and who cares? Who appreciates it? I do, Mother. I assure you, I appreciate it very much. You? What good is it to you? You never live here. When I die, you will have to sell it. On the contrary. Don't I... argue, dear. You know you will. It will be sold. All my work will be forgotten. Disappear. Fact is, we should have left years ago when Ian died and I should have taken a flat in London. But I've suggested London a dozen times, and you've always said you would hate to live there, that your only interest was in this house and garden. Have I? Oh, well, I, I dare say I have. One says anything. Anyway, what does it matter? My life will be over soon, thank goodness. Oh, mother, dear, no, don't listen... speak to me. Leave me alone. Everybody can go away and enjoy themselves. 
I'm tired of you all. Oh, Mother, darling, please. There. I'm all right now. I apologize. I... Thank you, dear. I'm, I'm all right now. My back ached all night. I didn't sleep. And then that fool, that lunatic in the kitchen has broken the refrigerator again. And now, with the hot weather coming on, it really is too much. What's this tomfoolery about my not being able to dress myself, Laura? Is the day I can't put my clothes on, you can knock me over the head and have done with it? We all of us like to be helped at times, dear. Mm -hmm. Johnson always used to pull off your hunting boots, don't you remember? Hunting boots? are entirely different. I hate being messed about. Anyway, dear, I'm glad you're better. We were so worried. Oh, where's my geographical magazine? In your chair, dear. Oh. Well, Francis, dear, so you're ready. Yes, all packed. Oh, we have all enjoyed it here so much. You must come again with the children. You must all come again. How kind of you. Are you better, Mr. Anson? I'm all right. <laughs> you can't kill me. I go on boring everybody year after year. <laughs> Is it uh, eight years I've been here, Laura, or seven? Seven or eight? My dear David, it's 18. What on earth are you talking about? It can't possibly be more than... Uh, uh, it can't be 18. Yes, dear, it is. Oh, oh, of course, I'm such an old fool now. Time means nothing to me. The years pass and pass, but... Eighty, Really, I, I apologize. Don't be so silly, dear. I'm a sort of blasted Methuselah. You're nothing of the sort. <laughs> Come on, Doctor. It's time for my walk. Now, oh. let me take you for a walk this morning, dear. Up we get. Oh. <sighs> Very kind of you. Eighteen. Is there no end to it? One begins to feel there's been some mistake... One's been left behind, so to speak, while all one's friends... Are... Shh, dear, now don't. Now, where would you like to go? Just to the pond and back? Yes, yes, the pond and back. The pond oh, Doctor, and back. if you see Willie Gregson, tell him I'll be with him in a few minutes. Oh, uh, what? Oh, uh, oh, uh, yes, very well, very well. Francis, I've so wanted to speak to you. Twice yesterday evening I tried, but each time it seemed as if you were anxious to avoid it. We all talked so much yesterday. Too much, perhaps. Oh, really, you've changed so little, Julian. Watching you climb that cliff, you might have been 25. Do you know what it is that makes people grow older than their years? It's not hard work. It's not even failure. It's shame. Disgust with oneself. Living vulgarly. Dear, I didn't mean to talk seriously. You were out very early this morning. Yes, I went for a walk. In the wood, I saw a tree that was blown down in a gale some years ago. Although it still lies on the ground and most of its roots are broken, its branches are covered with young leaves and fresh roots are growing in place of the old ones. Is that a parable? It might be. I can't help thinking that a life like a tree might renew itself and put out fresh roots, as it were. Yes. But would it ever be quite straight again? Wouldn't it always be twisted in some way? Oh, I'll be out of our depth in a minute. Yes, and it's nearly time No, no, to don't go. go. You keep evading me, and I must talk to you. Well, then, let's talk of the past. Let's talk of what's pleasant. And the future? Couldn't that perhaps be pleasant, too? Last night, after you'd gone to bed, my mother told me something of what had happened between you and young Farrah. And the more I thought of it, the more I realised the extent of my own responsibility. Oh, but that's nonsense. On the contrary, my thoughtless behaviour 20 years ago drove you into an unsatisfactory marriage with Edison. And all that followed was a direct consequence. And that's undeniable. Julian, you can't go through life feeling responsible for the actions of a girl who happened years ago to fall in love with you without encouragement. You can explain my behaviour in a hundred different ways, but nothing excuses it. Oh, 
I meant to show you rather amusing photographs. Yes, but do you mind, please, not changing the subject? We've little enough time as it is, and before you go, I must tell you that... Oh. There now. I'm talking to you as if I were giving orders to a clerk. And what I want to tell you, what I want to say is simply to beg you to consider becoming my wife. Oh, Julian, no. Why, no? You haven't thought... I've thought all night, and I'm sure. And the certainty and the longing to speak to you made me so impatient. And the hours till morning passed so slowly. I walked because I couldn't stay still. I felt so exhilarated. And the morning seemed to be shining entirely for my benefits. No. Surely it's simply providential that you and I should have met here again now at this particular moment. Julian, and it's not providential at all. It, it's only an accident. You're reading into our meeting some significance that isn't there. Oh, don't think I'm not flattered and grateful. I, I am. But really, it wouldn't do, Julian. It, it's not possible. Oh, I've been too awkward and abrupt. I understand that now, but in a year, say, when you had enough oh, it time isn't to... That. It isn't time I need. Oh. Then you can only mean that it's not possible for you to love me or to think of living as my wife. Is that it? You think we'd be happy, but we wouldn't. You think we can go back to the beginning and start again, but it, it's not possible, Julian. You're making a mistake. You say that with such appalling certainty. I know what you feel. Because you've had so much unhappiness, you can't believe in a new life, oh, but... a new life. How like you that is. Do you know how it would end? I should disappoint you, Julian. You... You believe so much, and I so little. You think of me as the girl you used to know grown older, but I'm not. I'm, I'm quite different. I'm changed. Some sort of flame seems to have burned out, and now I'm just cold and old and empty-hearted. I don't believe it. And if you are, I'll change all that. Oh, for God's sake, believe it. Do you know that the only times that I remember with pleasure are the days when you and I spent our summers together here, in this house, on the beach, before I went away? It was always fine then. <laughs> or so it seems now. Oh, those days are gone, I know, and we've changed. But surely there's something left of them still alive that might grow into a new kind of happiness. No? Is it so impossible? Say something. Oh, I shouldn't have come here. This should never have happened. If I hadn't come back, you'd never have thought of me, never have wanted to see me again. That would have been so much better. I'm not fit to share your unhappiness, is that it? Have I really so little understanding? Stay with me, Francis. Please. It's too late, Julian. It's, it's too late. But, um, no, don't say any more. Here's Matt. I think I'd better give you the keys now, Mrs. Farrer, before I forget it. And these are the lists you wanted. Oh, thank you, Matty, yes. Toby's box will want mending before he goes back next term. Yes, he needs a new one. It's really too small. It would be better. Mm. Now, we, we arrive at Paddington at 2.30 with the children. What time's your train north? Oh, not until 5.30. Mm. We shall all miss you dreadfully, of course. Well, partings are uh, never very agreeable. I hope the children will continue to make progress at school. Come and see them sometimes, Matty. That would be very nice. Oh, uh, excuse me, I have something for the doctor. Here's the address you asked me for. Address? What address? Uh, that's the one. The, the, the luggage is all packed and downstairs, Mrs. Farrer. Her hand was shaking. What can be the matter? It's nothing. It will pass. Finally, you come to the dwarfs. The only ones that can exist at such altitudes. Uh, yes, dear, of course. Now, you sit down, uh, and one of us will read to you for a bit. Uh, thank you. Uh, Doctor, I uh, was reading an article on Lapland or um, Canada to him. Here, you'll find the place marked. It's here! The taxi! The taxi! It's here! 
please, dear. dear, not so much noise. I'm sorry. Can I go in front with the driver, Mummy? Can I? I'll come and see you off. Say goodbye nicely to Uncle David. Goodbye, goodbye Uncle David. David. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. Come again and cheer us up. I shall be back in a minute, David. Goodbye. No, no, I'm not going. I shall be back in a minute. Read him the bit about the dog race, Doctor. Goodbye, Mr. Anson. Yes, yes, goodbye. I'll be back in a minute, dear. I know, I know. Everybody shouts at me this morning. Do they think I'm deaf? <coughs> now then. Morning saw the whole population agog with excitement to witness the great Canadian husky dog race. Ah. Again and again... A strangely thrilling cry of mush echoed and re-echoed on the frosty air. Uh, mush? That's what it says. Again and again... Oh, the... uh, whose children were those? Oh, uh, Mrs. What's-her-names. How do you feel? Well, I have a bit of a pain in my chest and my head. Have a rest. They're all gone. A lot of noise and talk... I'm too old for it. There'll be no noise now. You can have a sleep. My tie is a bit... Oh, too tight, is it? Uh, Here, I'll do it. Uh, there. Ah, uh, thanks. You're tired, old man. You will sleep. Mm. What's the matter? Mm. He's had enough. When Julian comes back, don't mention Francis Farrer. Talk of anything else. I'll explain later. Oh, it's one thing after another. Poor Julian. It seems as if nothing can go right for him. It's worrying, it, it really is. I mean, is it my fault? There are times when I wonder. Well, Julian, they've gone. They waved to me all down the drive. Delightful children, really. But noisy. Oh. Don't. You know, a girl like that governess really ought to get married and have children of her own. Why doesn't she? She's not bad looking. One can never understand these things. She'll be an old maid, though. One can see it coming. Oh, very likely. Oh, well, medicine time. I never realised, dear. It never occurred to me. Oh, it doesn't matter. Evidently, she didn't feel able. She's very changed, isn't she? Yes. She's changed a great deal. Really, dear, I, I don't think it would be very suitable now. Years ago, of course, it might have been a different thing. Yes, yes, that's right. I'm so sorry. Well, naturally, I'm disappointed. I had hoped, in spite of everything, that she and I... However... Meanwhile, it was good to see children about the place. Living and working continually among older people, one is apt to forget that half the world is young. Yes, we may fail, miss our opportunities, live stupidly, grow old, but always behind us come the young ones, with new energy, new ideals, new faith. And not all of them will fail. No. Some will succeed, live splendidly, Achieve what we have scarcely dared to dream of. Yes, I dare say, but what are you going to do now, dear? What? Oh, I shall go back to my work, of course. My career isn't finished by any means. I'm pretty certain to be promoted soon, a year or two at the most. And then I shall be a counsellor or head of a department. That's something, after all. And then I intend to come back here a good deal more in the future. Oh, do, dear. Yes, I will. I intend to learn gardening. I dare say you've got some books on the subject. Plenty. There's a good deal we could do. For instance, we might use the stream to make a sort of water garden, lilies and so on. <laughs> and then it occurred to me this morning that if we were to cut down three or four trees over there by the front door <laughs> and clear away the undergrowth, we could make a great vista stretching away to the sea and border it with azaleas and flowering shrubs. Do you see what I mean? Yes, dear. Yes. There's really no end to what we might do. There's no end.
In A Day by the Sea by N.C. Hunter, the part of Francis Farrer was played by Rachel Gurney, Julian Anson by Richard Herndl, Laura Anson, Margot Boyd, David Anson, Rafe Truman, Dr. Farley, Gerald Cross, Miss Matteson, Catherine Parr, William Gregson, Peter Tuddenham, Humphrey Caldwell, Gerard Green, Eleanor, Elizabeth Proud, and Toby, Adam Richardson. The producer was Norman Wright.